as you see in your worship bulletin for this morning. The gospel lesson for today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 45 and 46. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Children of God, let's listen up for God's word to us this day. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In pondering what is called the seven last words of Christ, our Lenten sermon series has now taken a very distinct and very dramatic turn. As you may recall, we began on the first Sunday in Lent by reflecting upon Jesus' prayer for the forgiveness of those very ones who were putting him to death. Father, he prayed, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What love, what amazing grace grace and love which extend also to you and to me this very day. Father, forgive them. Next, as you remember, we considered the word of assurance that Jesus spoke to the repentant thief who was crucified on a cross next to his. When the criminal asked, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus responded, even through his own anguish, I tell you the truth, today, you will be with me in paradise. Then last week, we contemplated two of Jesus' last words or statements or prayers. I am thirsty, Jesus said, demonstrating the most ironic of ironies. In fulfillment of scripture, Jesus, the very Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the source of living water, cried out, I am thirsty. I shared this quote last week, I must again today. Episcopal clergywoman Fleming Rutledge has written this about this particular passage. The one who gives the calm of lakes and pools, the freshness of brooks and streams, the majestic depths of seas and oceans, the glory of pounding surf, the might of Niagara, and the tinkle of the garden fountain the one from whose being flows the gift of the water of eternal life, this is the one who is dying of a terrible thirst on the cross for the love of his lost sheep. And then also last week, we pondered Jesus establishing a new family, a family founded in his love, not in ties of, of blood or legal, legalism, but a family founded in his love. Jesus said from the cross to his mother, dear mother, here is your son. And to his beloved disciple John, he said, and here is your mother. Instituting a new family of faith, a family to which we all belong. All such powerful images, some beautiful even, and wonderfully comforting words. These first Four words of Jesus from the cross, what lessons, what images and illustrations we see. But today, we find no such beauty. We see no giving of comfort or assurance, no explanation. We hear only a cry of severest agony. According to Mark chapter 15, verse 25, Jesus was crucified the third hour of the day, which was nine o'clock in the morning. You see, back in that culture and that time, the day officially began at 6 a.m. Therefore, the third hour of the day would be at nine o'clock. We just heard in our scripture reading for, day, for today from Matthew, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, which means that would be from 12 noon until 3 p.m., Darkness came over all the land. Luke 23, 45 adds the detail, for the sun stopped shining. It has been said that this midday darkness was so dark that a man couldn't even see his own hand in front of his face. 
When it was supposed to be at its brightest, the day was turned to darkest night. And then, near the end of these three hours, near the end of these three hours of of thick darkness, a voice cried out, a loud voice, Jesus' voice, crying out in desperation. This was the Aramaic which he spoke. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Surely the most staggering verse in the gospel record, the cry of Jesus, the cry before which we must bow our heads and our hearts in reverence and try to understand. There have been various attempts to penetrate the profound mystery of these words. I will have time to share only three. First, serious Bible students will recognize one of the Old Testament Psalms woven throughout the entire crucifixion account. It is Psalm 22, as many of you know. It even begins with the exact same words Jesus cried from the cross. Psalm 21, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalm continues, I am scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Still further on, we read in this 22nd Psalm, a band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Exactly what we have been reading in the gospel reports of Jesus' crucifixion. Clearly, this 22nd Psalm, written hundreds of years before, was foretelling with perfect detail the events of what was now taking place that day on that hill called Calvary, which has led some Bible scholars to suggest that Jesus was, in fact, intentionally repeating that psalm to himself and to others who were standing nearby, offering some kind of uh, maybe a degree of encouragement or hope. For although this psalm begins in complete forsakenness and dejection, it ends in soaring triumph. Psalm 22 concludes with, From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For all dominion, all power belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And so it is suggested by some that on the cross, Jesus recited the opening verse of Psalm 22 as a framing of his own situation and as a song of his confidence and his trust, well knowing that the psalm began in the depths but finished on the heights. Well, friends, this might sound at first like an attractive interpretation. And it is true that the 22nd Psalm is one of prophecy, foretelling events surrounding the death of the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One, Jesus. But reality is, while dying an agonizing death, crying out in a loud voice, a man does not recite poetry, even the poetry of a holy psalm. Jesus must not be pictured here as merely reciting the opening line for an outline of salvation history. The whole atmosphere of Calvary was one of unspeakable horror unrelenting anguish, and unimaginably excruciating pain. Jesus was not merely an actor reciting the lines of a pre-written drama. A second possible interpretation of this cry from the cross, Scottish Bible commentator William Barclay has written this, it may be that there is something, if we, if we may put it so, more human here. It seems to me, Barclay wrote, that Jesus would not be Jesus unless he had plumbed the uttermost depths of human experience. In human experience, as life goes on and as bitter tragedy enters into it, there come times when we feel that God has forgotten us, when we are immersed in a situation beyond our understanding and feel bereft even of God. 
It seems to me, Barclay continued, that this is what happened to Jesus here. Here we see Jesus going to the uttermost depths of the human situation so that there might be no place that we might go where he has not been before. Sisters and brothers, yes, it is true that Jesus did fully identify with our human condition, suffering to the uttermost depths in order to know and experience any pain or, or feelings of abandonment that we may go through in our own lives. That is true. However, this second line of interpretation still is not sufficient to explain Jesus crying out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is my strong personal and studied conviction that only now this third explanation comes close to satisfactorily addressing this most poignant and most powerful word from the cross. During these three hours of absolute darkness, three hours of absolute darkness, it was then that he who knew no sin of his own was made sin for us. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us. Even though Jesus was always fully divine as well as fully human, he voluntarily laid aside his rights and his privileges as God. He willingly surrendered himself to death, even death on a cross. These words cried out that day were a deep expression of the anguish Jesus experienced when he took upon himself the sins of the world, causing him to be temporarily estranged from his father, to lose that relational intimacy that he had known through all eternity. This may be why Jesus didn't cry out to my father, but instead, my God. As difficult as it is to explain and surely to understand, Jesus' cherished fellowship with God the Father was temporarily broken as he took the sins of the entire world upon himself. With the sins of the world upon him, with your sins and my sins upon him, Jesus experienced the agony of separation from the Father. Abandonment. God forsakenness, the turning away of the Father's face. That's really what forsaken means, the turning away of the face. Undoubtedly, this is what Jesus dreaded most as he prayed the previous night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 39 tells us, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The physical agony of the crucifixion was horrific enough. But even worse by far was this period of spiritual separation from God. Jesus bore the judgment for our sins. He paid the penalty that we deserve. He served our sentence and endured our punishment described in Isaiah 59 too. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Yes, Jesus suffered this forsakenness by God so that we never need to, if we believe in him, receive him into our hearts and lives and accept his sacrifice for us through faith, believing. We can know forgiveness, salvation, fulfillment, life, abundant and everlasting. Friends, glory to God, the story does not end here with Jesus despairing and desolate. Just as the 22nd Psalm, so does this story continue and conclude with victory and praise. And at this time, I invite you to, to make sure you're here on Easter morning 
March 31st, when we will, at three worship services, celebrate the glorious resurrection of Christ from the grave. However, for today, this is where we must pause, where we must stop, as we are left to ponder this divine mystery of our salvation, this mystery before which we must bow our heads and our hearts in thanksgiving, in worship, and in wonder. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thanks be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the meaning, the significance of your cry from the cross is so profound, so far beyond our ability to comprehend. And yet it was so perfectly fitting to meet our need. For we acknowledge and confess, Lord, that we are totally unable to save ourselves, to cleanse ourselves. But we are completely reliant on your love, your mercy, your grace. Although mere words could never express our gratitude, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for taking our sins upon yourself, for paying our penalty, for suffering the punishment which we deserve, providing for our salvation. And you did it all. You endured it all because of your love for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This day and throughout all eternity, thank you. And in our gratitude, we also pray that you will help us to live out this gratitude in the surrendering of our lives to you. For we pray to the honor and glory of your holy name, our Lord Jesus. Amen.